If you have your manuals, you can go ahead and turn to page one. You can see all the titles here that we're going to be working with, and those are just, um, <clears throat> well, we'll be working with them, obviously, and going through them. Uh, at the same time, there'll be some uh, blending of the two, and there is a particular reason why we are holding this seminar. Uh, <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> there has been, and probably will continue to be, quite a bit of controversy over the exercise of faith, over the exercise of dominion. We've talked about these things before. And honestly, just as, well, if you read the back of your manual, there should be an insert the back, that says that if you're going to basically work with God and fulfill His will, you will exercise dominion. It's just that simple, right? Now, in the introduction, we can start there. Obviously, well, hopefully uh, you've already read that. Um, but there's an aspect of living the dominion life. We can talk about it. And one of the main purposes of this seminar today is to get beyond just talking about living the dominion life and actually bringing it into being in our life. Uh, one of the big problems in the church is that people come to hear preaching. And they'll come and they'll listen and they'll hear some preaching and then they'll go home and then they come back next Sunday and they expect a sermon next Sunday. And... <clears throat> Very honestly, one of the main things about preaching is not about the preaching, but, but about the assimilation of what was preached. And many times we end up um, just waiting for the next sermon rather than taking it into us and putting it into practice. I've actually, there was a, well, it's been about two or three places that I was going to on a regular basis. And every time I went there, I was trying to head in a certain direction that I, I, I knew uh, what God wanted to say. And yet, because of the people that were there and the direction they were going, it ended up going a different direction. And it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit going that direction because I didn't really want to get into that stuff. Uh, I wanted to, to preach what he'd given me. And so, but because every time we got there, uh, the people were so into, well, just legalistic type stuff and uh, all kinds of rituals and things like that, that the Spirit of God rose up inside of me. And, and every time we went there, it got to the point where when I knew I was going there, it's kind of like, boy, I sure hope they've changed that because I really don't want to just blast that again. And it got to where I just kept blasting it every time I went there. And it was amazing because I was speaking directly to them. There was no, uh, no, no vagueness about what I was saying. And yet they would get up afterwards and say, oh, this is just wonderful. Isn't this a blessing? And, and isn't his words just, you know, the, the, the word of God is just amazing. And they didn't even hear what I was saying. Because if they had actually heard it, they wouldn't have been saying all that. So, <clears throat> so many times, uh, you know, we go from one message to the next, meaning one sermon to the next. And it's not about sermons. It's about life. It's about how much of the Word of God we put into our life and how much we actually absorb. And so many people just come to church on Sunday or go to any church on Sunday and they just keep hearing the next message, the next message, and they never take the time to actually go in and, and put the last message into their life. Um, I probably won't be using this example much today, but I'll just say very quickly, uh, back whenever I was teaching martial arts, Everybody wanted to get to the good stuff. You know, they'd come in and they'd say, well, if I train hard and I do this, and how long will it take to get, you know, this rank, or how long will it take to do this? Which is really impossible to tell, especially when a person just walks in the door because you don't know anything about them. And invariably, uh, when we come in, everybody knew what we were going to do. We had a, a set routine of what we did. And we always started out with warming up, and the warm-up usually started with footwork and things like that just to get your body going and get the blood flowing. And they knew that. And invariably, there would always be a handful that no matter when they got there, whether they were running early or running late or anything else, instead of, you know, there'd be the, the real students that would get in there and start doing footwork and start warming up. And then you'd always have the ones that would stand against the wall and talk about, oh, have you seen the latest, you know, this fight or that fight? Have you seen this and what's going on? And they, all they wanted to do was talk about fighting. They didn't want to actually train. And so <clears throat> one of the things I've noticed about Christianity is it's very much the same. 
more people are more interested in talking about miracles and talking about the things than they are actually training to be in a place where God can actually use you to do the things that you talk about other people's lives. And everybody wants to be Wigglesworth, just nobody wants to live like Wigglesworth. And that's one of the big problems. Now, in the seminar today, and in these teachings we're going to be looking at, we have to realize dominion is not a Sunday word. Right? It's an every day of your life. It's all the time. It's how you live. Dominion should be a part of how you live. Right? It should be such a part of you that you don't even think of dominion. You just live your life and other people will talk about how you walk in dominion. Amen? Amen. It's not about just learning a message. It's not about just learning. Because honestly, you know, well, I'm sure they have, but I will tell you, there's no new verses added here. You know, I'm sure somebody's got a new Bible out somewhere where they put in some new words and you know, they've already started changing the concordances now to where the definitions... I've got a concordance from 1978, I think it was. It's fallen apart and it's, I don't mess with it much anymore because it will fall apart. But if you go in and check the definitions of that volume with the definitions they have in the newest one, they're different definitions. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, honestly, we have to realize that the enemy wants to change things. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that goes right along with how most people feel because most people want something new every week. Mm -hmm. They don't want to come in. They don't want to do footwork every week. They don't want to come back in and do the same drills. And, and, and it was amazing because we would do certain drills over and over and over. And they would be looking at me saying, when are we going to do something else? I said, when you get this. When this is such a part of you that whenever I walk up and I grab your wrist and you automatically do it without thinking, then we can move on. Until then, it's not a part of you. And until then, when you go out on the street, as soon as something happens, you'll forget it and you'll be standing there getting hit. And it's the same way in Christianity. Most Christians want the next message, they want to hear the next sermon, and they want to move to the next thing rather than drilling the basics and making it where the, every time you meet the enemy, you don't even have to think about it. It just comes out of you exactly what you need to do. Until that's in you, the Holy Spirit is really not free to bring out whatever He wants, and you end up having to go back and think about it, and then your mind gets involved, and if your mind isn't that too renewed, you know, if it's not renewed very much, then you're going to end up thinking some type of theological idea rather than the reality of what God has provided for us. And so today, a lot of this today is about you learning to assimilate dominion into your life. You know, Dr. Summerall actually had a, a book one time, I think it said, it's called Dominion. Uh, it's yours, take it. And he was always trying to emphasize to people, and now I see it because... Uh, I was there and I watched people come from all over the world uh, just to get him to pray for him or say a couple of words to him. And the funny thing is, he almost always said pretty close to the same thing. But he always told him, you know, if you were, if you were getting the Word of God and get your face out of the television, you wouldn't be here having me do this for you. You'd be able to do it for yourself. Yep. And honestly, that's still true today. So, so we're going to look at some things. First off, uh, page three of your manual here. <clears throat> the first session here is called Living the Dominion Life, and it literally means having dominion, exercising dominion in every area of your life. Now, just in case you're for some reason not familiar with it, in Genesis chapter one, this is not in your notes here, you might want to just jot them down, but in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and it's 26 through 28 actually, uh, God told them, God made man, and then he said, let them have dominion. And then he starts to say, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and everything that creeps and crawls and you name it. Man was meant to have dominion. That was God's plan, right? It's not a man's plan. It's not something we look back and go, well, that was just for then. No, it was for Adam, for man, and it was for all time, right? Now, just to prove that to you, I'll give you a couple more verses. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said, Behold. That means take notice. Don't ignore it. Behold. Look at it. I give unto you power. The word power there is exousia. 
and it means literally authority, which is what? The right to exercise dominion. You got that? He said, I'm giving you authority to do what? To tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And notice the power there for where it says power of the enemy is the Greek word dunamis, and it means literally ability. So you have authority, the right to exercise dominion over all the ability of the enemy. Okay? Now, that means, and you need to not read things, anything into this, right? And don't read anything out of it, okay? Read what it says. He said, I give you authority. I, and he wants us to have dominion. That means in every area of our life, not in some areas, not, not in, you know, when you're around church people, in every area of your life. And the, one of the main keys is starting to get uh, to, to exercise authority in every area. That means you have to, in the areas that you've not exercised dominion before, you need to practice. You need to start stretching yourself. You need to find it. Um, I could give you some examples probably a little later on, but you need, whenever I was learning about faith, I started stretching myself. And I started using faith in areas that I'd never thought about faith before. And I started doing it on purpose. And very honestly, in the beginning, it was pretty childish stuff and pretty simple stuff. But the key was I, was, I had faith in my mind all the time. And I was always looking uh, how I should exercise faith in that area. And then I started realizing if you're going to exercise faith, faith has an output. And whenever you exercise faith, that's called dominion. Right? So the, the, uh, the blending or the joining of faith and dominion are a natural and should be a seamless part of your life. Right? If you're going to exercise, listen, all you're doing, when you exercise faith, all you're doing is exercising the power of God over a situation and trying to get that situation to change, to line up with the word and will of God. That's all you're doing. So whenever you exercise faith, in faith, you will exercise dominion. And we know from Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus met with a centurion, centurion came to him. He said, this man has greater faith than anybody I've ever met even all the people in Israel. And he said, and, and the reason for it was that this man understood authority, which is what? The right to exercise dominion. See, it's just that simple. You can't separate dominion from faith. Right? Now, you, you have to remember, Christianity, what you see as Christianity is not the Christianity of the Bible. Right? If that were true, everybody would be walking around like Jesus. So it's not. So what we have to do is look what the Bible says. Set our, our hearts, set our minds on what the Bible says and doing what it says and not trying to somehow compare it with what you see in day-to-day -day Christianity. Right? Uh, I always differentiate between the two. You've got Christianity, which is what Jesus did. Okay, and you've got churchianity, which is what most today's Christians do. And as long as churchianity is good for people, uh, as long as it satisfies their, their need, whatever it is, then they don't push on into Christianity. But there comes a point where churchianity will not meet your need. And usually at the point where churchianity doesn't meet your need, that's where people create sacred cows. Because that's when they'll start saying, well, it didn't happen this time, so there must be this reason. And they start looking for, you know, so-called spiritual reasons. And it's not. <clears throat> Bottom line is, whatever you put your faith to, it should work. Whatever you exercise dominion over, it should be, well, it should be in subjection to you. It's just that simple. And it's in every area of life. That's one of the things I noticed about uh, Dr. Sumrall. It didn't matter where he was at, it didn't matter what was going on, he embodied dominion. And, you know, even today there are certain things, certain teachings and stuff that if he were alive today that I would respectfully disagree with him, I would talk with him about it, um, I wouldn't be disrespectful or anything, but at the same time I wouldn't agree necessarily, but yet you still see dominion in his life. And, and it got to a point where, honestly, most people looking at it, would say, oh, that's ridiculous, that's going too far. But you don't understand. 
there are, when you start messing with somebody's personality, you can change one thing and it'll have a ripple effect right, in other areas. There, there are certain things, I have certain uh, mannerisms, quirks, whatever you want to call it, right? And I'm not saying that the Bible says to necessarily do that or be that way. But if I changed that, it would have an effect on my personality that would weaken me in other areas. You understand? So what it, what it is, it's, it's amazingly like um, national politics or, or international politics where you really want to help these people, but if you do, you got a treaty with this person, and if you help them, it's going to cause trouble with them. So you have to start figuring out, okay, how can I help this person without getting this person mad? And then you start finding out there's some kind of backdoor deal made that nobody's supposed to find out about. And so there are certain areas in your personality that you need to set certain things. Myself, you know, for one of the things, uh, you know, I made a vow to God when I was nine years old, I'd never touch alcohol. Well, the Bible doesn't say that you cannot drink, technically, right? Now, there's a whole bunch about it, and I don't agree with it, and you know, I don't like people that work with me or that I work with drink that, that you know, I wouldn't like them to drink, that kind of stuff. Uh, but can I just say, you will not drink? No, because the Bible didn't actually say that, right? But for me, I saw what it did. And so I set boundaries, not necessarily boundaries that God said I had to set, but I know that I set them so that that thing could not find a way in like it did even in my dad's life. And so because of that, I set that boundary. Now, if I move that boundary, who knows? Maybe I could have handled it. But on the other hand, I had good experience that shows that I probably wouldn't have been able to. Right? And, I, and honestly, it's never hurt me not to drink. Right? Whereas it, there was a possibility of it if I had of. So some things you just have to cut out and say, you know what? The Bible doesn't say I have to do this, but to make sure this area is here, I will cut that out. Right? It does talk about offending other people and you doing certain things to offend other people and not doing things to offend them. And so there's an area there, but in your own life, you are to have dominion in every area of your life. I know Dr. Sumrall, you know, he, he believed everything was forward. You always move forward. You never back up. And because of that, actually, he, if he left, actually he did this a couple of times, left his Bible somewhere and they'd be leaving and he'd say, oh, I left my Bible. And they'd say, well, you want us to wait for you while you, while you go get it? He'd say, no, send somebody else. And they said, why? He said, because I don't back up. He said, me going back and getting a Bible, they'd be backing up. I, I thought, first time I heard that, I thought, okay, that's crazy. That's, that's just out there, that's weird, right? But it was in his mindset of what it meant to back up or to go back. Once he made a decision, he didn't question it. He said, you know what, even if I made the wrong decision, God is able to change the situation. And so he moved forward. So now, <clears throat> another one. So we've looked at Luke 10, 19. And I want to look at the end of it. In Luke 10, 19, he says, I give you authority, the right to exercise dominion, to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and overall the ability of the enemy. And nothing, underline nothing, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. See, that's a verse very few Christians believe. There's uh, several words that most Christians don't believe. You may have heard me mention before. One of them is nothing, and the other is any. All right? Those are two of them right there. Most of them don't believe whatsoever. They don't believe whosoever. Okay? Uh, they don't believe all. And so if you take those five words, those are five words most Christians don't believe because they always have some type of uh, explanation why it wasn't all or why it wasn't them, why they're not a whosoever. Right? And so you have to go in and first off decide to believe every word of the Bible regardless of whether you like it or not. So in uh, Matthew 28, so we've already talked about Genesis 1, 26 through 28, Luke 10, 19, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and in Mark 16, 15 through 20. You can just jot these down. You, most of you already know them. <clears throat> but in each of these places, Jesus says, I give you authority because I have authority, therefore you go. So you go in my authority, not your own. You go in my authority 
and you go out and you teach and you preach and you heal and you set free and you do these things. And what were they doing? They were exercising the dominion through Jesus that God had originally given Adam. Right? Now, <clears throat> then in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, I'm just giving you a quick rundown so you have several scriptures to see this. In Matthew 10, 8, Jesus tells him, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you've received, freely give. Don't pick and choose. Don't decide who deserves it and who doesn't. Set the captives free. Then in Luke 9, verse 2, Luke chapter 9, verse 2, it says, And he sent them to preach, proclaim the kingdom of God, and to heal the sick. Now, this is one thing that we need to uh, look at today, uh, in the church world today, I should say. Jesus never commissioned any person to preach the gospel that he didn't also tell them to heal the sick. Right? He never said, go and preach, but don't demonstrate. He never said that. He always said, you go preach and then demonstrate the kingdom of God by setting the captive free, by healing the sick, by casting out devils, do all these things, preach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of God's supremacy, and when you do that, afterwards, demonstrate. Right? And so he always showed those. So God wants us to walk in the authority of Jesus, which was the last Adam, and we are to walk in him, and our minds are to be in him and not in uh, you know, first Adam, you should say. So now, now we finally get to page three, which is part one, right? And this is about it, dominion in every area of our own life. That means every area all the time. Now, we'll give you a couple of these, but first in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thou therefore my son, he's talking, Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice, be strong in the grace. Grace is not weak. Right? Grace is strong. To be able to show grace to someone, you have to be strong to do it. And the only way you're going to be strong to do it is strong in Christ. Right? But you're going to have to be strong, and just as he told him here, be strong in the grace. Okay? And there is a strength in grace of being able to forgive, of being able to give people room to grow real easy and when when I was younger uh, <clears throat> I definitely fell prey to this but it is real easy <clears throat> to draw lines and cut people out it's real easy why well because honestly when you're young you don't think in terms of the grace you need and so you don't want to give them grace and when I say young I'm not talking about just young in age I'm talking about young in faith young in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the faith, I should say. But you have to give people room to grow. Everybody doesn't start where you are. right? And so you have to realize and give them room to grow, not just draw lines and cut people out. And Dr. Summerall used to say, when somebody draws a circle and cuts you out, you just draw a bigger circle and include them in. He said, when you do that, he said, the first thing that's going to happen, you're going to make them real mad because now you think you associate with them and that's why they cut you out. They don't want to associate with you. And he said, so that's the first thing you're going to see happen to them is they're going to get pretty riled up over it, right? So we need to give people time to grow, give them grace, give them room to grow, help them along just like a child. You don't just tell a child, well, you know, you, you tried to walk and you couldn't, so I'm just going to, you know, break your legs and make you sit the rest of your life paralyzed or something. No, that's stupid. Hey, what are you going to do? You're going to say, ah, no, you can do it. Come on. No, don't worry. And they're going to sit there and look at you. No, come on. And you help them get back up. And yet when it comes to Christianity, well, they don't believe like me. Cut them off. No, give them room. You didn't believe like you did either at one point, right? And somebody gave you grace, hopefully. Okay. And so you give them grace. The point is we are to raise people up and lift people up, not condemn them, cut them out and tell them that they don't know it yet. Right? So you have to work with them. That's part of the fathering aspect. If you don't have the fathering aspect in your life, you're not experiencing the fullness of God as your father. 
So there has to be that part where you start to father. And that means you encourage, you train, but at the same time, if there needs to be correction, you're willing to correct, right? Now, in verse 2, And the things that you have heard of me, meaning from me, okay, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So that means also that you have to be thinking everything you're sharing should be passed along. So that means that you have to, first off, recognize, is what I'm saying worth being passed on? Is the way I'm treating this person worth being passed on? Is this doing to others the way I would want to be done? So you have to look at and say, okay, what, the, what, I'm, what, what these people are hearing in me is this what I want to pr- reproduce in their life? Because it's very true. Uh, you know, we, we teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are. And you can have people that know the Bible. They know the scripture. And yet you, you can tell by who they sat under by how they are sometimes. Not always, because every student doesn't pick up all the characteristics of the teacher. But you can see how a person is many times and we have to make sure that what we're passing on, the information, the way we're doing it, the, the, because it's not all in just information of just presentation. Sometimes, or not sometimes, always, there is the aspect of the underlying spirit of the person that what comes out, that's what the people catch. So it's not just knowledge, right? Matter of fact, I'll be honest with you, as far as knowledge, I didn't learn that much from Dr. Sumrall. Why? Because I'd already studied uh, I'd been in Tulsa. I'd studied faith. I understood faith, uh, you know, from the teachings of faith, right? <coughs> Dr. Simmerall didn't show me any new scriptures. He didn't give me anything new like that. The difference was I watched him walk it out. And I saw his attitude. Man, this man had strength. He had, he had dominion. He exercised dominion. And yet he was the gentlest, kindest person to anybody but religious people. Kind of like Jesus. Right? If a person came along with this religious thing, he was a little, you know, he still loved him, still gave him grace. He wouldn't argue. He would just state the truth. And if they wouldn't argue on it, he'd say, well, if that's working for you, you come back, tell me later how it worked out. You know, people would come to him all the time. Brother, I had a, I had a, a vision, had a dream, and, and this is what you need to do. <laughs> and he, he told him over, he told him several times, sometimes right from the pulpit. He said, if you get that, don't come to me. He said, if you're so close with God, he's talking to you like that, you go do what he tells you to do. He said, I'm busy. I, I'm, I'm doing stuff. And he said, I'm already doing what he's told me. So if he's telling you, it's so you can do it. Don't come tell me to do what he told you to do. And so he's just very <laughs> direct. But at the same time, I've seen him be just so gentle in how he dealt with people and he loved people. And yet most people never say, well, what stands out about Dr. Sumrall? Oh, just love. I just sense love. No, that's not what you get. Right? That's, that's not what you see when you watch him. Right? So, <clears throat> so we have to make sure that what we are teaching and passing on to others. Number one, we have to make sure that, that we are passing it on, that it's not sticking with us. You know, I, I did a, a message one time. God really brought it out. It was several years ago now, but it really emphasized Will your gospel die with you? If, if, in other words, if you, if you could right now, if something happened where you could never again preach or lay hands on anybody or teach anybody or talk to anybody, how far would your gospel go on? Would it die with you because you haven't reached anybody, because you haven't taught anybody, because you've not discipled anybody? What you, you have to think in terms of the future, right? Not just what, what you can get. But what are you imparting? What are you giving? And so we have to make sure that, what number one, that we are teaching people who will also teach it. Right? Number one, we have to make sure we share what we know. But then we also have to make sure that who we share it with will share it with others and that they will share it in the same spirit that we share it, meaning that, we, that hopefully that you're passing it on in a way that will cause it to be continually passed on. You know, uh, there are people right now I can, well, I, I could name some and some are already passed on now, but some, there are people that people used to go to to get healed, but that's it. They wouldn't go to them for anything else. Why? Because they had power with God to get people healed, but if it came to anything else, they wouldn't even talk to them. 
You know, Wigglesworth was a lot like that. You know, people never came to his house. Why? They loved his meetings. They wanted to, to come and, and, and get healed by him and, you know, maybe punched or whatever it is, however, however he did it, right? But they would come and get healed. But any other time, they didn't want to talk with him. Why? Because he was rough. And so we have to make sure that it's not, that we're not just sharing information, but that we're also sharing it in a way that makes people want to carry it on. And so now, again, we're still talking about dominion and we're talking about taking authority. The first area you need to take authority is over you. Right? The greatest deliverance you'll ever get is being delivered from you. You being delivered from you. You get that? That's the greatest deliverance you'll ever have. And so we need to realize that <clears throat> there has to be that part first. The Bible says that a man that has control of his own spirit is stronger than a man that can take a city. Amen. Amen? So the first area is in our own lives. We have to change our own lives and have dominion. And we have to make sure that sin doesn't have dominion over us. That uh, attitudes don't have dominion over us. We have dominion over it. You, you wake up in the morning just in a bad mood, you need to immediately, as soon as you recognize that, you need to go in there and look at yourself in the mirror and start talking to yourself and telling your attitude to change. You don't ask it. You don't say, well, yeah, I wonder why I feel this way. I wonder what, it, no, who cares why you feel that way? Change. <laughs> why you feel that way doesn't mean a thing in the world. Just change, amen? Whatever you need to do. That, and I'm not saying that, you know, you just go, oh, okay, I'm going to change. You, you can get to that point. But many times it means go put on music. Go put on something else. You put on something that, that you can worship to, something that will cause the attitude change. Right? You know, I can go places and hear music on the PA system that they have, on the speaker system. And it'll be music from, you know, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. And when you hear it, it puts you back there. And immediately you can feel that where you start to not necessarily remember, but it puts you in the f same frame of mind you were in during that time when you heard that song. And you have to immediately take authority over that thing and say, no, I have power over you. That spe little box up there is not going to dictate my mental attitude. Right? And you start speaking to that thing. You speak to yourself. You speak to your soul. David spoke to his soul. And he said, soul, you bless the Lord. Amen. And so you have to speak to yourself. He said that he, he, whenever nobody else could encourage him, he said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. <clears throat> now, the Bible says, if you want to be wise, walk with wise people. And so it's good to walk with people. But there are times when you may have to walk alone if you're going to walk in truth. And if that's true, you're going to have to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. And part of that encouraging yourself means to changing your attitude. It means to change your, your outlook on things. You need to take dominion over your mind, over your spirit, your soul, and your body. Yeah. Right? And when you start to exercise dominion of that in those areas, you watch your life start to change. Right? You have to exercise dominion. You can sit, be sitting and watching television. And one program go off, and the next one come on, and the next one not be good. Something you don't need to watch. And you actually have to have dominion enough over yourself to say, okay, body, get up and get out of here because you don't need to watch that. Turn it off and go do something else. Right? Or maybe somebody doesn't want to turn it off or don't want to change it. Then get up and you leave the room. You don't have to, you know, now, if you're the head of the house or, you know, overseeing and there's children or somebody else there, yeah, take authority of that thing. Take that box and turn it off, right? And tell them, go do something. And, you know, don't go get it on a device. Go actually do something, right? Go outside where there's grass and dirt and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, everything isn't electronic. Mm -hmm. It's going to be amazing. It's gonna be, if, if, the, if the electronics or if the uh, electrical system ever goes down, it's going to be hilarious to watch. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, as soon as it goes down, everybody's just going to stop. And they're just going to stand there. You know, be looking at their thing going, <laughs> why isn't it working? I mean, it's just because they're so wrapped up in devices and technology. Yeah. And we have to realize, that's why I still like books. You say, well, they're, they're, they're going out of style. Yeah, whenever you get rid of yours, I'll still have some. <laughs> and whenever the, if the power goes out, guess what? I'll still be able to read mine. Because right? I can light a fire. Right? But you might not be able to get your device to charge up. And you got all that stuff in there. That's why everything I write, I print out. Why? Because I don't want anything locked in something I can't get a hold of. Right? Especially when it's mine. Right? So, I'm starting to meddle a little bit here, but... We're going to keep going. So, 
And look what he says here in verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness. Well, that's not a verse everybody likes. Right? You don't pull that one out of your little promise box every day and read it. and Endure hardness. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. No, that's generally not what happens. Right? That's one of those you look at and go, oh, oh this is for you. Yeah. No, it says to endure hardness. Amen. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What makes you think your life is supposed to be easy all the time? There's nothing that says your life is supposed to be easy. And yet we spend all of our time trying to make an easier life. You know, I, I was, I, don't know, I was watching uh, James Robinson last night. And they were talking about, there was a lady on there that was talking about uh, how she helps save these girls out of sex trafficking and that kind of stuff. And they were in Cambodia. And I remember when we were in Thailand, we saw the same kind of thing. And you can see it everywhere. And we get it right here in the States. You know, right here in Houston was one of the largest sex trafficking rings uh, in, in the United States. And so we got this stuff going on. And yet the church is so busy waiting for the next worship CD to come out that they actually don't put any feet to their faith. They want to make sure, you know, they'll build the biggest mausoleums you can, you'd call them churches, but most of them are mausoleums anyway. But they'll build the biggest, prettiest thing. Why? Because they want to draw people into it rather than realizing in here is not what's important. It's what goes on out there. It's how much of this here that we have in us that we actually put our feet to and actually make a change. Right? Christianity was never meant to be a theological system of discourse. It was meant to change lives. It was meant to change the way you live. Amen? To endure a hardness. That means what? You do things on purpose. Or I should say you don't do things on purpose. Just so that you have. You know, the Bible says that, well, just so that you have, so that you can help other people. Right? But we don't think in, in those terms anymore. In the early days of the book of Acts, they, they, they sold all their stuff and they all, you know, basically had all things in common. And I'm not saying that that's the way it should be necessarily today. I'm saying the attitude of if you need something and I have it, it's yours. That's the attitude we need. Why? Because there's nothing on this earth that matters. No thing you have matters. Amen? Amen. So we've got, to, we've got to go back to the original plan of God. And, and you know, there's, well, you see these, uh, well, the verse I was going to tell you a minute, a minute ago. The Bible says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands. So that, now listen, not so that he has a good life, so that he may have that to give to those in need. In other words, if, here's a, a thief. His life is supposed to be so changed that now he actually works, and he works for the purpose of making sure he has something that if somebody needs something, he's got money or something to be able to help them. <clears throat> Think of that kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. Yeah? That's not the mentality of the church. The mentality of the church is, well, if you have faith, you'll be rich. Well, if you have faith, you're already rich, rich in faith, which means that you can get whatever you need. But why do we always make those needs about ourselves? Why don't we look at using our faith for the needs of others? You know? well, every time, uh, well, recently, <clears throat> especially, uh, anytime there's an Amber Alert, I don't just start watching for the car, you know, or looking for it. I immediately go to praying and I start commanding, this person will be caught. The child will be unharmed. The child will be returned and this, and there'll be no incident, but this, and I start speaking that. And to my knowledge so far, every time we've done that, we have seen the child return without harm. Every time. That's one of the reasons why we wanted this, the network. In building an organization, we're not just trying to build an organization. That's the last thing I want to do is sit around and sign papers. That is not, you know, in my agenda at all. And yet, the reason for an organization is so that whenever we hear something is happening, we can contact people and be connected with people so that if they need us to pray, we can pray. If we need them to pray, they can pray. And there's a connection. So if they hear something going on, they can contact us and we can start exercising faith and dominion over that situation. Not just, you know, pray mercy on, uh, not mercy, but, uh, well, mercy too, on the people. And, well, God bless them. You know, help them, Lord. They're going through a rough time. No, no. 
It's more than that. We have to start exercising dominion in every aspect of our life. Now, he says, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ to endure hardness. No man, and here he's giving the example, I don't know why we don't see this today, but he says, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. He tells us right there, don't get entangled with all the stuff. Don't get encumbered. Don't let things have you. Don't, don't be thinking in terms of, well, you know, I'm working a little overtime this week. What's the next thing I can buy? No, maybe that overtime you're working for, maybe that needs to go to help plant a, a Bible school or plant a church or support a missionary. Mm -hmm. okay? Not just what we can have. Because I'm, I'm telling you, anything you have can be taken from you. Yes. Amen? And the best way to not have it taken from you is to not own it to begin with. Whatever you have, make sure it belongs to God. Right? So, he says, verse 5, And if a man also strive for masteries, or to win, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? Now, all he's saying is, listen, if you're running for a crown, what crown are we racing for? The crown of eternal life, the crown of righteousness, the crown that we're going to receive from him at his appearing. Isn't that right? And so when he talks about this, he said, listen, if you're going to run the race and you're, you're trying to, to run to win, to get this crown, then you've got to run lawfully. Well, what is lawfully? Well, take it in context. Running lawfully means enduring hardness as a good soldier, not getting entangled with the affairs of life. If you're entangled with the affairs of life, guess what? You're not running lawfully. You know, I, I heard another minister, I, I watched like maybe an hour, uh, yeah, about an hour last night, um, of Christian television. So, you know, it may explain some of the, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it that's coming out this morning. But I was impressed. There was a person that I don't get a chance to listen to much, um, but uh, they, made, they made a point. They said, you know, God has been telling us, he's been telling me, get back in the word, strip away the things that don't matter. And I'm like, glory to God, that's, that's a big thing. For, for this person to say that, that's a big thing. And now the, the truth will be whether we, they actually do it or not. But we have to realize what we're here for is not to gather and, to, and to, to gather up and to gain. We are here to be effective and useful for the kingdom of God. That's why we're here. Amen? That's what a good soldier does. A good soldier, you know, whenever... Uh, I can give you two examples real quick. During World War II, uh, whenever the Allies, actually when it was wrapping up at the end of World War II, and the Allies would go into Germany, and they went into uh, Goering's uh, house. They went, well, actually they had several mansions that the high-ranking Nazis lived in, and they would go in, and these soldiers that had been living in, you know, <laughs> they'd been living in foxholes, they'd been living in mud, had cold weather, all that kind of stuff, and then they get to go into Gehring's palace and get to, to sleep in his bed and had the best of everything. They knew what it meant, and like Paul said, to, to abound and to be a base. Right? And whenever it was possible to abound, they abounded. Why? Because they were able to take those trophies and those spoils of war from the enemy. But they also knew what they had to go through to get there. And so you have to be able to live in both ways at any time. And whatever comes... You don't complain. You don't gripe about it. You do a good job. You keep your mouth shut. You be a good soldier. If, it, if it's hardness, you endure it. If it's abounding, you endure it. Right? You say, well, it's a lot easier to endure the, the abounding. Yeah, but a lot more people fall when they abound than whenever they endure hardness. That's just the way it is. So the second illustration was even in the recent uh, Iraq war, in the first one, uh, whenever they went in and stayed in Saddam Hussein's palace and had all these things and you see the pictures of the soldiers uh, you know in the in the this huge Olympic sized swimming pool and gold furniture and all that kind of stuff and you know they, they were thinking well we have arrived guess what they didn't stay there long they were just there a short while and then of course everything else was confiscated and they had to go back to living in tents right? and so as soldiers we have to be willing to live wherever we are do whatever is necessary to get the job done amen so, notice here, verse 6, and this is the main reason I brought this verse up, this passage. The husbandman 
that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. And he says, consider what I say. The Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, the reason I say that is because he said here that we should be first partakers of the fruit of what we're doing. So if we're preaching the gospel, we should be the first partakers of that fruit. That means that if we are preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom especially, but the gospel meaning the gospel of healing, the gospel of freedom, all of these areas that are part of the gospel of the kingdom, then we ought to be free. We ought to be healed. We ought to be first partakers of the benefits of the gospel that we preach to others. Now, that does not mean that until you become a partaker that you don't help other people. Sometimes it's just a matter of sowing and reaping and you need to be sowing, right? And even if you're not reaping yet, you can go ahead and start sowing. People say, well, if I'm sick, should I be praying for the sick? Well, unless what you have is contagious, yeah. If it's contagious, then pray from a distance, right? Stand back and extend your hand. Don't touch them, right? But you should be first partaker. So, yeah, but if you need to sow healing, then you'll reap healing. It's just the way it works. But at the same time, you need to be first partaker. You need to be experiencing the benefits of the gospel. And that doesn't mean you wait until you do, but you should be. So you, you don't just settle for just living uh, without those benefits. If you're going to preach the benefits, live in the benefits. Amen? Now, we will look at this. I'm going to give you a break, and we will come back in a few minutes.